Amen. Growing up, I've been in all different places, you know, but I can remember even as a young child, I can remember uh, going to um, stations of the cross and just feeling the presence of God, you know, because my heart was open to the things of God. So, um, but without the presence of God in our lives, we've got nothing. And um, we have to eventually get to the point in our lives where we realize if we don't have the presence of God, we've got nothing. You know, sometimes when, when we're young, we start searching here and there for some kind of satisfaction and love. You know, we start looking all over the place for, for things that our heart longs for and desires, things that we think are cool and fun. But the bottom of all of it, there's nothing that satisfies outside of the presence of God. Because it's in the presence of God that is everything that our heart and souls desire. Amen? Amen. And so we just got to surrender once and all, once and all to, the, to the things of God. Amen? Let's look at, um, we're going to start with just going ahead and looking in Galatians. Um, you know, we, sometimes we do refer to like, when the, when the Holy Spirit gets to move it in a different direction and we get into that space-time continuum <laughs> and nobody knows what's going on, what time it is, and nobody cares. You know, when ladies' mascara gets to running, <laughs> everything's running, even ladies' mascara, it's running everywhere. So um, when we don't care about how we look in front of other people, you know, that's one thing. The Holy Spirit cannot move. He can only move it to the degree that we allow him. And when we are concerned about what other people think, even in church, you know, I don't want people to think I'm weird. I don't want people to think I'm over super spiritual. Or, or I, you know, I, want, I don't want people to think I'm not spiritual. You know, when, when we're concerned at all about what others think around us in church, we will we will put the brakes on the Holy Ghost doing what he wants to do. And he might not. He might just want you to sit there and act proper. <laughs> but sometimes proper might be laid out on the floor for a while. Sometimes proper is crying or laughing. Whatever is of the Holy Ghost, we have got to be open to the spirit of the living God and let him speak to us and let him speak through us, let him move how he wants to move because we, outside of the Holy Spirit, we know nothing. Outside of God, you know, we have to separate these things. We live in a spiritual world. The universe is a spiritual place. Amen. Then there's the natural side. The natural side is everything that God said. God said, there, let, let there be light. Let there be the sun and the moon and the stars. God said, let there be, you know, Andrea's fish. And God said, let there be, <laughs> let there be steakhouses everywhere. He said, let there be food and plant life and he's everything that we can feel and touch and we see with our natural eyes those are all things that god said let there be so he spoke from the spiritual realm he spoke the natural realm into existence so everything that we can see with our natural eyes everything that we hear with our natural ears all of the natural things god said let there be from the spiritual realm. So the natural realm can't negate the spiritual realm because the spiritual realm always was. The realm of the spirit where, where God lives in that. So when he spoke things into to existence and then he put Adam and Eve here to um, control, sustain, be the boss of... <laughs> And of course, we knew they blew that in the garden, but still mankind is still in charge, is supposed to be in charge. And so we have to em embrace the fact that we are spirit beings because God gave us life. He put a spirit in our human bodies. And when did, the moment that a person is conceived, God puts a spirit inside of that person. God doesn't wait for the first, second, third trimester. He doesn't wait till 30 seconds after birth. The moment a being is conceived, a human being is conceived, God puts a spirit in that being. And so 
we are in this space time. <laughs> we are in this place of being a natural being, yet having a spirit that's given to us from the spiritual realm. Sometimes we just have to really meditate on these things to get our to wrap our heads around it. Amen. That we are spirits. We live in a natural world that God spoke into existence. And we are always natural until we ask God to come into our life who is supernatural. And then when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord, we're born again. And at that second, just like at the second, at the very second, you are conceived, a, you, you obtain a spirit. Or I should say, it, 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 God gives that spirit flesh, even though it's a m m microscope, you couldn't even see it at that, some point. And then it develops and grows. So just like you are conceived, naturally speaking, from the natural side, the flesh side, flesh and b blood and bone, just like you're conceived from that side, and, you, and then from that moment, you're developing enough to where you can be sustained, sustained outside of your mother's womb. And then you didn't, don't get your spirit at the time you take your first breath. You have already have a spirit. So you are born naturally. And then when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are born again. And now you are supernatural. So even though you are a spirit born of God, you make a decision. And at that moment, you make a decision and accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. You become not just a natural, a spirit living naturally. You become a supernatural spirit living in natural flesh. Amen. So we have to really meditate and ponder and think about these things and pray and ask the Lord to give us a deeper revelation of who we are in Christ, right? And more so who Christ is in us because the word of God says that Christ is in us and he is the hope of glory. Amen. So when we have a, the clear understanding we have of the glory of God that lives in us, the presence of God that lives in us, the deeper revelation and understanding, then we can live like we are supernatural as God has intended us to live. Having authority over the demonic realm, having authority over the natural life. That's why miracles... Miracles are nothing more than something outside of the natural realm moves into the natural realm and causes something to happen that otherwise would not be able to happen. Jesus walking on water. Amen? A miracle. Opening blind eyes. A miracle. You know, some people think, you know, if, if somebody has eyeballs, you know, and they, they look totally fine, but they just can't see, and then God gives them sight. Well, that's a miracle. No less or greater of God putting somebody that doesn't have eyeballs in their sockets and putting eyes in their sockets and they can see. It's still a miracle. It's something that natural, uh, natural nature, natural life, doctors, people, nobody can do these things but God alone. And that's our Father. He delights in doing the supernatural for his children he delights in doing the supernatural for humanity if we would just believe that we're not just natural, but we are supernatural. You get up in the morning, you believe you put that foot on the floor, supernatural just got up. And when you know it, the devil shakes. When you don't know it, he's got it over you. So wouldn't it be a benefit if we knew these things because God's people perish because of a lack of knowledge, not a lack of power. God's people don't perish for a lack of healing power. 
God's people don't perish for a lack of, of prosperity or having needs met. God's people don't perish because of these things. God's people, God's people, the supernatural people, perish because of a lack of knowing that they have these things and that they're at our fingertips. Why? Because we're the children of the living God and we're supernatural beings. Amen? I just think about this morning when we had pre-service prayer, I was just meditating on, during prayer, I was thinking about the, um, you know, just kind of having a little mini flashback of my life and thinking about how many countless times that the presence of God was so, so obvious in my life, the presence of God and God would speak to me or God would show me something or reveal something to me, or I was going through a tough time and he comfort me in that tough time, or, or when I just didn't know what to do and he would speak to me and give me, he would give me knowledge, he would give me wisdom in a situation. Sometimes we just need knowledge, supernatural knowledge on how to handle a situation. We also need supernatural wisdom because it's one thing to have the knowledge, but wisdom tells you when, how, where. Because you can know what to do, but you have to have supernatural wisdom. So God is a supernatural God and gives us all supernatural wisdom when we call on him and ask him for wisdom. And it's, it's funny because God just doesn't drop wisdom on us. According to James chapter 1, it says, If any of you lacks knowledge, you can go to God who gives generously. And this is what the devil tries to do. Well, you don't deserve wisdom because look at your life. No, it says be without looking for fault. That means God's not looking. Well, he's not looking for fault in our lives. Did you know God never gets mad at us because we screw up? We probably get madder at ourselves and madder at other people for screwing up, but God doesn't get mad. God just wants to fix it because it doesn't matter how we've messed up. God wants to supernaturally move into our lives and give us knowledge and wisdom on how to change things. Amen? And, um, you know, this is a, a big fault in the American church. I don't want to say the church because there's a lot of, you know, the church of the living God and many nations are, people are just so hungry. They haven't experienced the Holy Spirit and experienced the things of God, and they're just so hungry and so grateful. But sometimes, you know, the church in, uh, in the good old USA... <laughs> has a tendency to take things for granted because we've had the things of God so long. And the church in the USA will sometimes have a tendency to take the things of God for granted and not be grateful and thankful and start picking what they want, what they don't want. And, you know, the Word of God says in the last days that there's going to be a great falling away. It also says that there's, there's going to be um, a lot of false apostles and prophets funny it says a lot of false apostles and prophets i'm sure there's false pastors out there but it talks about apostles and prophets there are going to be false prophets out there and they're going to um, um, speak to people in their vain imaginations from their vain imaginations into people's lives that want to hear you say something instead of what the truth is tell me what i want to hear don't tell me what god says because why god's word makes us as individuals accountable. Amen? It's not like living under an avocado tree and just wait long enough, they'll fall out and hit you in the head. That's not how this works. The word of God holds us as individuals accountable. You know, it's just like a doctor goes to school. He can't say, well, I went to school. Well, did you read? Did you study? Well, no, but I mean, I went to school. I was there. Well, I don't think I'm going to have you having doing brain surgery on me just because you attended. I want the best, somebody that studied, somebody that knew what God's word says. Hear what I'm saying? You go to a dentist, you don't want somebody that just every time you have a problem, they just pull the tooth. How would that be if every time you went, uh, I'm a dentist, I went to school. <laughs> I learned how to pull teeth. That was my expertise. How would that be? I go to a dentist and his expertise is pulling teeth. He, he learned all the other stuff, but he's not as good at it. He's just really good at pulling teeth. How would that be? I go to a dentist that likes to pull teeth. <laughs> no, 
we, if we're going to a dentist and you got somebody working on your teeth that you have to have in your mouth for the rest of your life, you want somebody that knows what they're doing? How would you like it if you got a doctor that just loves doing root canals? You might not need one. He just loves to do root canals. <laughs> he loves doing root canals. And so every patient that comes in, you need a root canal. And you're like, what? So you're getting all these root canals and found out, you know, that doctor's a root canal specialist. You're like, what? He just does root canals on everybody. Wouldn't that be bad? You want to go to somebody that understands, no, you don't need a root canal. You just need to get your teeth clean and, and brush them. <laughs> you know? You go to a doctor, a heart doctor. He loves putting pacemakers in. He's going to put pacemakers in everybody. He just loves to put a pacemaker in. <laughs> you, you think, I don't know, I have a pain in chest. Maybe I should go to a heart specialist. Don't go to the one that loves to put pacemakers in because <laughs> you're going to be in trouble. You want somebody that has a full knowledge of an understanding of these things. How silly is it us to go to, well, I don't want to go to a pastor. I don't want to go to a church that, you know, they're going to tell me that I have to pray and I have to read the word and that I have to stop sinning. <laughs> well, that's your problem. <laughs> what am I going to say? <laughs> it's your mother's fault. You know, it's your mother's fault. That's why you were so screwed up. See, that's what I thought and that's what I needed to hear. No, that's not what you needed to hear. You need to hear, this is your fault. This is your problem. And you need to go to God and do whatever God tells you to do and it'll get fixed. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. That's a problem. That we have the PC culture. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. And we have churches everywhere that we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. So, you know, they had this, the first mega church that was in Barrington, Illinois. What they did is the pastor wanted to, wanted to appease the people. You don't have a church to appease people. You have a church to bring God into the community. And so sometimes if people don't really want God, they don't want to live in holiness and they don't want to live according to the word, they won't go to church because they don't want to hear it. So this pastor, this man, went around the community door to door and had his little survey and finding out what everybody wanted in the church. Well, I want to have this, and I want to have a, we got to have this kind of children's, and we need, we need buses, and we need really good contemporary music, and, and we need a smoking room, and <laughs> we want a cigar club. I mean, you know, all of these things to appease to the flesh. Well, thank God if people get saved, that's all I can I mean, really, if people go there and get born, I'm talking about really truly born again. If they get born again, praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so you have, there's all, how many of you know, if, I don't care if you have a church of 10 or 10,000, you are never going to make everybody happy. 